management impacts on pasture group growth. And a few announcements. We are running everything 15 minutes later, so we will catch up during our lunch hour and a half or an hour 15 minutes. So that's where we will uh, catch up because of our late start this morning. Uh, this presentation is being made by Dr. Thomas Griggs from uh, West Virginia University. He's involved in forage and grassland management research <coughs> as well as teaching at West Virginia University. Uh, his interests include plant animal interactions with pastures, management of pasture nutritional and botanical composition, extended season grazing, and planting management of sustainable forage livestock system. He grew up in Vermont and has been uh, also been active in forage and grassland management research, teaching, and extension in Idaho, Utah, and Washington State. And he came back to West Virginia just to talk to us today. <laughs> Welcome Dr. Griggs, please. Thank you. Thank you. Can, can you hear me well enough? Uh, I'm happy to have you speak up and ask questions as we go. Um, if I wear my glasses, I won't be able to see the slides, but I can see you. I'm not going to wear them, so you're going to have to speak up so I, because you're sort of a blur in the um, uh, Happy to be here and, and uh, excited that you're interested in these kinds of topics. Um, some of what I'm going to say is going to overlap of course, with what Jim Harris has led us through, some of it's going to overlap with what Kathy Soder just spoke about. How many people were in Kathy Soder's uh, pasture pitfall just a while ago? Okay, so I'll, I'll uh, there'll be some commonalities. Um, the committee asked me to, to speak about some of the research we've been doing, pasture management research we've been doing at West Virginia University uh, in the last few years. And I, I need to um, caution you. Um, we're still part way through analysis of these data I'm presenting. We're, we're really in the infancy of, of analyzing a lot of these data. Um, and so we have more years that I'm not going to show you, partly in the interest of time. Um, so don't take these as final relationships. We may find we have variation from year to year to year. That's still a few months off. But Okay, so I want to talk in general about what, what we've learned from research we've done with defoliation management impacts on pasture growth and also root growth. The root growth is an area I'm moving into more recently, um, but the, uh, the pasture growth is something uh, we've been doing for a really longer period. But a lot of our questions um, stem from work we did some of you may have heard someone speak about this in the past. We, we had a project at the Reedsville Farm with winter grazing heifers on stock piles, uh, cool season mixed grassland and pastures. Um, and we were able to get stock pile uh, heifers uh, on stock pile pasture um, to obtain all of their diet from pasture through December into mid-January, depending on the year. And in some cases, we had to stop because of um, snow and, and more importantly, ice conditions. Other years, we just ran out of forage. We'd only stockpiled enough uh, to be able to get to or through mid-January. And so the heifers remain on our pastures for the rest of the winter. We fed uh, hay or, or, or draft hay for the rest of winter. And so we had uh, fairly severe grazing on those pastures during the remainder of the year, particularly uh, late March, early April, as pastures started to regrow more of the grass than the legumes. And an even though animals were being provided with hay, adequate hay, they would nip off the emerging grass. And uh, we noticed over the years, uh, we had a, a definite mechanical shift from grass legumes, maybe 30% legumes, 20 to 30% legumes, to as much as 70 or 80% legumes, uh, just over a three year period. And we began wondering if that was uh, largely due to the severe late winter, early spring grazing, uh, nipping off that, that sort of regrowing grass repeatedly. And so that led to some experiments, and I'll lead you through a couple of them. So just for some background, I want to talk briefly about what other 
people have found the distribution of, of roots in uh, grasses. Uh, I want to talk about leaf area index and why that's um, uh, an, an important management uh, tool you can use for monitoring pastures. And then at some point, we'll talk about the trade offs between defoliation frequency, we talked about rotational stocking, um, forest production, and nutritional value. How do those things interact? Um, so then the two projects, I'm going to lead you through simulated grazing impacts. This was done by clipping, not actually done by grazing, small plot on root density and pasture growth. And then um, total season pasture production in response to that late winter, early spring period when we either defoliated large exposure areas closely and severely or protected them from grazing. So the, so the, the, the bottom part was actually done. <coughs> so if we think about, other speakers have talked about pasture as a solar collector. If we think about maximizing plant products as we do want to maximize the activity of that solar collector, um, minimize losses due to respiration and senescence, senescence meaning you know, death of, of older tissues, particularly down lower where the canopies are shaded. Um, shaded leaves are not productive, you all know that, they're not receiving sunlight, but they have an energy cost, they have a maintenance cost because they're still alive, they need calories from sunlight. Um, forest mass increases until the canopy intercepts approximately 95% of sunlight. We call that optimum leaf area index, and I'll lead you through that with a couple of graphs. You might think, well, a canopy, a solar canopy should be intercepting 100% of sunlight. We want the most efficient capture of energy by our solar panels. But what happens is as we get beyond 95% light interception, as our canopies get taller or denser, yes, we can intercept 100% of sunlight, but that means it's not getting all the way through the soil surface, so the basal tissues that are still alive need energy from somewhere. They're not getting it from sunlight, so they have to, they, they have to feed off the rest of the plant. And so if we back off to about 95% light interception, we learn that that maximizes plant growth. Uh, often the leaf area index, though, depends on canopy architecture. So if we think about more upright stature grasses versus more flatter leaved legumes, it doesn't take as much leaf area index by flatter leaved legumes to reach that 95% light interception. So, leaf area index itself is nothing more than surface area, one side of surface area of leaves from a unit area of land. So if we take a square foot of land, pasture, we delineate a square foot, let's say we cut that forage, if we could run that all through a leaf area meter or put it on a photocopy or scanner and figure out the leaf area, one side of each leaf, by reaching the sunlight. How many square feet of leaf would we have per square foot of land? And that ratio is the leaf area index. And so normally we think about what the figures do. We think about uh, as we go through these, these leaf area units, the, the pointer doesn't really show up very well. These leaf area units are these ratios. So one square foot of leaf per square foot of land, two square feet of leaf per square foot of land, and so on. And you'll notice that the, the top half is, as we go through this range of three to approximately five leaf area units per land area unit, we reach 95% light interceptions. If we reach it earlier with the dashed line legumes, because they're flatter, and we reach it later with grasses. So leaf area index of approximately three to five for legumes captures 95% of the leaf time of life. Leaf area index of more like six to eight for grasses, which shifted over to the right, is required to capture 95% of the light. Okay, you go down to the bottom half, B, dry matter potential. We're really probably more interested in how much dry matter we're producing. And you'll see, again, we maximize dry matter production, pasture, total season, um, at leaf area indexes of somewhere around three to five, depending on the species. And beyond that, we don't really gain anything. 
gone to 100% light intersection, but the bottom of the canopy doesn't get the sun. And so we're just sort of cycling things from the top of the canopy. The bottom is falling apart. We're replacing the top. So if you put this into <coughs> another version, we can talk about as if, if the pasture growth is the, the vertical axis, rate of, of pasture ground matter growth. As we add more and more leaf area on the bottom axis, so the threes or fours or fives, we maximize total photosynthetic capacity of, of the canopy. That's the line on the top. But you notice it plateaus once we get beyond seven or eight leaf area index. We don't gain anything. And the reason we don't gain anything is we've got all this death and senescence and, and ground tissue that's not getting sunlight down at the bottom. And so the bottommost curve there shows you where we maximize actual rate of dry matter accumulation. And you'll see this peak is what's happening at that so-called optimum leaf area index of something like five to six in a mixed vast region canopy. So we'll come back to that. So if you want to see well, what those numbers actually look like, this is a uh, a bar with a series of solar uh, sensors. Uh, and you can slide it into a canopy. Uh, you can have the, the tripod has a sensor above the canopy. You can slide the bar into a canopy at soil surface level. And the difference tells you how much of the incoming light is being absorbed or intercepted by the canopy. And you can convert those numbers to leaf area index. So just as an example, this would be what we would call a leaf area index of about one. So typical grass, legume, uh, dock, plantain, dandelion, pasture at least one. So we're intercepting about 43% of the incoming solar radiation away from the rock. We don't have enough leaf area there to make use of all the sunlight. So let's go up higher. Here's the leaf area index of two. And you can see that flow rates might be 04 to 5 inches tall. A lot of bluegrass in this one. So now we're capturing 72% of incoming sunlight. More efficient use of the sunlight. Better solar uh, panel. Here we are, we vary index 5. And that's kind of the, that's, that's the range for optimum, where we're going to maximize pasture uh, growth rate mm -hmm. over time. You can see there's a fair bit of creeping Charlie and Leighton in there. But so, so somewhere in that range is where we're capturing 95% of the light. If we go higher, here we are at eight. Now we've reached kind of a hay stage canopy. Well, the bottom of the canopy is shaded. Sunlight is not um, contributing to the growth of those bottom leaves. And so they're having to use energy from higher up in the plant. We're not gaining it. This pasture is actually growing there slowly than the one in the previous picture, even though there's a lot more forest. So, this kind of intersects with, and I know Jim talked about some of this, and so does Kathy Silver. When we manage pasture within a growth cycle, rotation and stop growth cycle, or you could apply the same concept to continuously crop pastures, we're trying to maintain pasture canopy at a stage where we're still getting as much leaf as possible, as little as stem, as little as domestic tissue as possible. And so as you go here farther out, longer growing periods, taller canopies, more forest mass, we're getting from green to orange and yellow, and the orange and yellow um, characterize stems and senescent tissues. So there's kind of an optimum there. And in many cases, for the kinds of pastures we work with, uh, grass legume pastures to be built. That's happening at something like 8 to 10 inches of height and something like 2,000 to 2,400 pounds of dry matter per acre to soil surface level. We call that urban mass. Now, you've all seen these classic curves showing pasture growth rate as you go through the season. March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October on the bottom axis. And we all know we have the spring flush in late April to late 
DNA, depending on where they are, and then the thing would taper off, which happens to be turning a ryegrass. The, the very top, I think, is uh, sunlight energy, solar energy, but, but the, the fluctuating curve is pasture growth phase, we go through the season, the typical food season feeding. We get about twice the growth rate in May that we do in July, even under well watered fertile conditions. <coughs> and so, in this particular case, with running a ryegrass, we're up at as much as 120 pounds of forage dry matter growth increment per day, per acre per day, uh, in uh, May, and we're down to about 40 or so in October. Okay. The bottom shows a series of growth curves. And many of you have heard about trying to keep forage in the phase two part regrowth curves, so that's the steeper, more linear part. But the black, I want you to focus on these black bands. So the black bands represent the period of time in each regrowth cycle, rotation of stop pastures, where we're below optimum leaf area index. That means during those black portions, <coughs> we're not capturing as much sunlight as we'd like to in that canopy because we don't have enough leaf area. We either graze <coughs> too closely or the plants are slow to recover for whatever reason. It could be a species feature like Timothy and smooth bone grass, for example, is much, much slower to recover than coarse grass and fall pesky. So I want you to think about when we go to more and more frequent defoliation, depending on how closely we graze, we're going to have one or more of these periods of inadequate solar capture. You add those up, and that can be a substantial penalty for the entire growing season. So we'd like to minimize that. How do we do that? Part of it is we try to, to, to leave enough residual leaf area so that we get rapid regrowth and, and uh, um, shorten up those periods of inadequate sunlight. Okay, I want to switch to what do we know about roots presently from, from past work? If we look at the distribution of pasture and, and hay crop roots as we go down through a bunch of soil depths, this would be Wisconsin work. Um, smooth grown grass, orchard grass, Kentucky bluegrass, Timothy, we don't have tall fescue on this list, but you'll notice three inch depth increments from cores where the roots were lost and laid. You'll notice, depending on the species, most of the roots are in the surface 0 to 3 or 0 to 6 inches, and the weights really taper off pretty dramatically for most of our full season grasses from 6 inches to 18 inches. So we have very, very little small proportion of our total root weights in those 6 to 12 inch to 18 inch crops. Now, we do have more in tall fescue and smooth grown grass. Smooth grown grass has a little bit better distribution than the other species. Kentucky bluegrass has one of the worst. Look how shallow the roots are in Kentucky bluegrass. They're almost all in the 0 to 6 inch, I'm sorry, 0 to 3 inch horizon. Same with Timothy. So, so we're working with a lot of very shallow rooted species to begin with. If we look at some work from the uh, USDA ARS scientists at Beckley, before the Beckley station closed, they did some coring of tall fescue and orchard grass <coughs> on hilltop site, uh, silt on soil, uh, by 10 centimeter increments. So 10 centimeter increment is uh, just a third of a foot, so that's four inches. So zero to four inches, four to eight inches, eight to 12 inches, and so on. This is percent of the dry soil weight coming out of the core that would be roots after they did washing. And you'll see maybe half a percent, 0.6 of a percent in that first four inches. And then it really drops off pretty sharply to, to nearly zero by the time we proceed. So again, the, the, and, and it's a little higher for tall fescue than it is for orchard grass. So again, a lot of these roots are inherently in that surface, four to six inches, we like to think they're much deeper than that. They are in some soils and for 
deep-rooted species like Catholic Awakening and um, Chicory and some of the warm season plant grasses. Now, uh, we think a lot about top growth, raising the impacts on top growth, total forest production. A lot of us don't really think much about the hidden half or the hidden two-thirds in some cases. And this is just a, just, just a, a good slide that we're going to think a little bit. This is, again, historical work where some sods were, were, were dug out of some of the western Canadian prairies. I think this is Saskatchewan and Manitoba, if I'm not mistaken. Um, rough fescue. And so these were from an ungrazed area, hadn't been grazed for something like 12 years, so well rested. They were cut, put into trays in greenhouse, allowed to recuperate, regrow. Then they were all clipped one time to a uniform height. Uh, I can't remember what that height was. And then they were allowed to regrow, but every four weeks there was a cutting treatment of some sort, either no cutting or every four weeks cut to an inch and a half, cut to three inches, yeah. cut to five inch stubble. And so they then totaled up, looked at forage weights uh, in the tops, root weights, and if you look at, this is grams now per pot, if you look at completely uncut, the one here on the left, 20 grams of tops, 15 grams of roots, dramatic reductions for the pots on the far right and, and one in that were cut to one and a half to three inches. But you'll notice the one immediately beside the uncut, we're at 16 grams for tops and eight grams for roots. So maybe an acceptable reduction given that we want to utilize these at some level for, for forest purposes. So you can see there's, there's a huge impact and you get thinking about, well, for my soil, where are my water resources? Where are my nutrient resources that these plants are relying on? And if they're deep, uh, the two plants on the right aren't really going to require any of those resources. So that kind of led to <coughs> trying to initiate some work with roots at the resort farm. Here's the condition I mentioned a little earlier when, when we started. Uh, one of our concerns was in, so this is taken April 10th, but in the month prior, uh, throughout the second half of March and early April, cattle were out, uh, basically continuously stocked, fed hay, but, but nipping away at the pastures. And we were curious about the impact of that on subsequent total season production, what to do with the roots, what to do with the crop growth, uh, and that led to Okay, so here's the kind of material we're working with. You saw a slide similar to this already. These are silt loam soils, uh, reasonably uh, fertile, uh, uh, pH is in the five and a half to sixes, uh, organic matter somewhere in the seven to the nine percent range. Uh, you can probably look very familiar to most of you. We initiated some clipping treatments. We, we didn't have the logistics to do this with grazing cattle. Um, so we initiated the clipping treatments to try to simulate one level of continuous stocking where every seven to ten days we simply mow the pots off to about a uh, four-inch stubble. Every seven to ten days, depending on how much growth we had, how much sunlight we had, we, we remow, basically we maintain a four to five-inch stubble. But we also did a series of rotationally simulation of rotational stocking where we took the canopy down to some residual stubble uh, in, in this kind of a manner. And so our treatments were ABCD. And, and our, if you go up to the top, our real question was, is there something we can do with root studies to get a shorter term picture of what's going on in our soils in terms of capturing carbon uh, building soil organic matters, or something we can do by studying roots that will tell us that, gives that information more quickly than a series of soil samples over 8 to 10 to 12 years, which is probably what it takes to really get that information into this sample for organic matter. So we were trying to look at roots as a 
an index of long-term soil management expenses. So treatment A, cutting weekly to 10 centimeters, that's four inches. B, we're letting things grow to approximately 10 to 12 inches, 25 to 30 centimeters, then cutting to six centimeters, about two and a half inches. So that's the only one that was cut that short. All the other ones were cut to four inches. So B was cut shorter. C, we're letting it grow just like B, uh, 25 to 30 centimeters, then we're cutting it to 10 centimeters, so four inches, uh, more lenient than B. Same idea as B, but more lenient. D, we were trying to simulate <coughs> letting the canopy go to hay stage. We're gonna take fewer of those cuttings. Um, uh, and then cut back to 10 centimeters periodically. And so if you look at the range of the clipping dates, depending on, we also have initiated half of these plots have been clipped twice with a lawnmower as close as we could set it during April. So we call that, we're trying to simulate that continuous stalking by the cattle uh, during that late winter, early spring phase. So, so we clipped twice to it, about an inch and a half in April. We call that clipped in early spring. So you can see we did that for the A's, B's, C's, and the D's. But then we also did one we called protected, where um, we didn't do any defoliation at all until May. And you can see the harvest date ranges basically uh, May through October, in some cases June through October, because took a lot longer for these bee treatments to reach that hay stage canopy, so therefore we didn't have any justification, justification for cutting them until they reached that stage. So you can see for the D treatments, we took four cuttings. For the A treatments, we took 20 to 22 cuttings. Bs and Cs, we took five to six cuttings. We had two sets whole plots for each field, we had three fields, so one of these whole plots would have contained A, B, C, and D, but, but it would have been clipped twice to an inch and a half stubble during August, or April. The other one was protected from clipping uh, in April and just, just allowed to regrow. And so if you look at either one of those whole plots where we've got the A, B, C, D treatments, this would be a typical scene as we go through the summer. This one is probably regrowing. This is going to be one of the B's or C's. Over here is a D. So again, those, those will be cut about four times, maybe cut five to six times. This is going to be an A that we cut 20 to 22 times. And you can see here's a D. When we finally got around to cutting the D at the A stage, this would be first cutting if you want to interrupt it. Um, you get some sense of what these treatments look like. And we did a lot of measurements with plates uh, and, and sticks, rising plate meters, falling plate meters. How many of you have used Ed Rayburn's plexiglass plate meter? Okay. How many of you use just a, a common pasture stick like they're passing out? <coughs> yeah, all right. And then we use these. Rising plate meters that have counters on them because it's easy to get a lot of data quickly. The counters can accumulate numbers. So, in each of these, at every harvest, a year, within a week of every harvest, might have been before, might have been after, we core uh, samples, uh, two inch diameter by about six inch uh, long, uh, just hand operated by a hammer corer, and we lined the cores, the inside, with a series of these jackets. And so you can you can take the core, once it comes out of the tube, and you can section it into a series of horizons from the sod on the surface to the, the, the little one six inch deep. And each of those is about 1.2 inches. So we can look at, wash the roots out of each of those horizons and look at how they're distributed according to the cutting treatments. <coughs> so let's look at some root responses. Uh, this is the first year. We're still developing our methods. We didn't sample as intensively in 2012 as we did in 2013. Uh, 
So this represents about 95, or I'm sorry, 96, or this is my height, it's supposed to be 96 or And we're comparing three different levels of treatment. So here are the whole plots, either the ones that were clipped twice in April, we call that continuous, or the ones that were protected in April. We're looking at root percentage in those cores, those lost cores. Um, and so we're lumping all the horizons together, this is the whole core. And you'll see there's no difference. Both of them are about 0.1 of a percent root weight in the, in the soil cores. 0.1 sounds kind of low, but if you think about a typical six inch depth acre pearl slice of soil being roughly two million pounds, 0.1 of a percent of an acre for a slice would be about 2,000 pounds of roots. So you're looking at something like 2,000 pounds of roots per acre there. If you look at the clipping treatment, A, B, C, D, uh, there were small statistical differences. C had slightly more roots, so we're calling that root density, um, than A, <coughs> uh, C, and D. Now, this is the first year, so we may not really have had treatment effects occurring yet. And this is a dry, hot year, by the way. If you look at sampling depth, and this is in centimeters, so four centimeters, six centimeters, so that'd be an inch and a half, uh, four inches, uh, five inches. You can see it drops off pretty dramatically. We're going from you know, two tenths of a percent to about a um, quarter. Yeah, okay, so that was 2012, first year we, we got data. We only did it once in the middle of the summer. <coughs> 13, we sampled five times, but I'm only showing you the data for two of the dates. So once in June, again, you look at the whole plot treatments, really no effect, very, very minor effect. If you look at the clipping treatments over here, A, B, C, D, we had small effects. B seemed to have slightly more roots, just like we saw in 2012, but not, not large differences. But the, by far the biggest differences were, again, in the sampling depth as we went from the surface to the deepest horizons. And here we had a lot more spread among the treatments. So we're up at about 3 tenths of a percent. So that would be more like 6,000 pounds of roots per acre down to about, again, about a fifth of that in the deepest horizon. So there's a big impact to sampling depth. If you look at the end of that same year, 2013, October, again, we compared whole plots. Did, did that have any impact on roots? Well, in this case, it actually did. And we're not sure how to interpret this. We found the plots that had been protected from early spring defoliation had more roots in them. So some sort of recovery in the fall was for some reason somehow better. We haven't been able to interpret that yet. So we had slightly more roots in the plots that have been protected from uh, early spring defoliation. Uh, clipping treatments, we had uh, no differences. Um, and again, sampling depth, big differences, two tenths of a percent in the surface, uh, about a quarter of that uh, in a six inch depth. Now, what's that all mean in terms of correspondence to forage growth? Did roots, diff any differences in root density relate to differences in plant growth? So we added up all the growth increments, so the four or five or six or 20 samplings, the lawnmower clippings that we did, we added up the amount of forage that we grew from the stubble. We didn't count the stubble, we only counted the regrowth above stubble height. Added those up and we compared the same kind of treatment. So here we're finding somewhere around 11,000 pounds of total season forage production. And it really didn't vary, didn't, didn't, uh, it wasn't different for the plot clipped uh, twice in April versus the plot that was. Protected during April, but there was a big 
cooking treatment impact. So here's where we're starting to see the impact of defoliation treatment on the forest. Less so on the roof, more so on the top growth in this particular case. And, and I'm showing you 2014 data because we're working backwards with the, the, with the data we have for that setup. So you can see the A treatments, continuous uh, defoliation, 20 to 22 times a week. Observe about 5,000 pounds. This is actually kilograms per hectare. Kilograms per hectare is essentially pounds per acre. Uh, think of them as, as interchangeable. So we're somewhere around 5,000 pounds total forage accumulation for the season versus 12 to 15,000 pounds for the B, C, and D treatment. B, C, and D um, vary a little bit, but by far the biggest variation those three uh, uh, rotational uh, stocking treatments versus the A treatments. If we look at the leaf area index, we took that repeatedly in each treatment throughout the season, and so we're now averaging those for the season. So these are seasonal average values. They didn't vary for the plot clipped in April versus the plot protected in April. But they vary you know, in a manner very similar to forest production. You can see in the A's, with, again, clipped every week to, um, what did I say, uh, four inches, 10 centimeters. We're at leaf area index of a little over four, which is probably not capturing that 95% sunlight interception. We're, we're probably um, too low to be efficient using all the sunlight energy that's, that's falling on the canopy. Whereas in the B, C's, and D's, we're up in that range of six, maybe even six and a half, so probably at a more optimal level. <laughs> and whether that's what's causing the higher forage production uh, in the previous slide, or, or whether they're coincidental, we're not sure, we're gonna have to just repeat that out. But you can see a, a, a big difference just in the clipping treatment. So, if I had to summarize that, uh, root density range from nearly zero to 1%, depending on the depth horizon in that zero to six inch uh, total sampling area, uh, averaged about 0.1%, root density of 0.1%, com uh, uh, translates to about 2,000 pounds of roots per acre to that six inch depth. We saw a variable impact of early spring defoliation uh, versus protection on roots, forest production and leaf area index. Middle to moderate impact of clipping treatment on roots at this point, but major impact on forest production and leaf area index. Root density decreases sharply to depth. So, all kinds of cautions and additional thoughts come to mind. Summer 2012 was hot and dry. 13 and 14 were more normal. Clipping treatments may not have been severe enough. Maybe we didn't push any of those treatments hard enough to simulate abusive grazing. Um, and, and so we're thinking about we may, our treatments may all be clustered too close to each other. Maybe we need to spread them out a little bit more in the future. We did see, I didn't show you pictures of this, but um, we had a botanical composition shift in the plots that were clipped weekly um, over this three year period. Uh, the the uh, vegetation shifted very heavily to ground ivy or creeping charcoal, no question. We might expect greater treatment differences if we had more defoliation sensitive species in these kinds of Plot. So if we had timothy, smooth grown grass, flat grass, green canary grass, alfalfa that don't tolerate clipping every seven to, to, to ten days, we might see more dramatic differences. The species we're working with tend to be fairly defoliation tolerant. Total season production, utilization by grazing animals can be uncoupled from each other. So even though we produce just as much forage in the bee treatments, the hay stage treatments, as we did in the Bs and Cs, those hay stage treatments probably were lower quality, probably were not utilized efficiently by grazing animals, and so 
We may have some advantages if we start incorporating forward quality considerations. There may be developing some advantages to the community and some treatment. So it gets us thinking about, okay, if we see these kinds of responses and we're trying to manage plants in relation to rainfall events, in relation to where our nutrient levels may be, maybe we have leaching of nitrogen to the low root zone, maybe we've incorporated fertilizer in the past, maybe we've spread it on the surface. It gets you thinking a little bit about which of those kinds of conditions the plants can respond to or be out of range to respond to. Okay, um, how am I doing on time? Okay, thanks. So let me leave you with the second study and then we'll wrap things up. Um, so, so we have these questions about, based on our stockpile storage, heifer, winter grazing, we began wondering, well, what should we be doing in the spring with our pastures if we want to maximize total season production and parent capacity, so getting beyond just the fall and winter feeding period. And so we put in, while we were still grazing our larger pastures, we put in a series of Exposure plots, they were each roughly uh, 100 by 300 feet. No, I'm sorry, 100 by 100 feet. So, so one, two, and three. And again, three fields for replication. So um, we opened up a third of each exposure either on April 8th or 9th and grazed it briefly, one to two day period with about 70 peppers and then took them off. Did the same thing 10 days later on the second third. Did the same thing 10 days later on the last third. So you've seen the, the uppermost uh, exposure uh, portions have been grazed and the other two haven't been grazed yet. Uh, we did that for two years, took forage measurements. Um, and I should back up. These have been, actually it's six of these exposure areas because half of them had been under the previous fall stockpile grazing management of high forage allowance where we were assigning daily forage dry matter of 70% to each animal, 7% of the body weight. The other half we've been assigning 3.5% of body weight of daily forage dry matter. So we have basically high versus low forage allowance or high versus low grazing pressure, high versus low stocking rate, high versus low stocking density. So double heights of approximately uh, three, two to three inches in the first spring grazing cycle more like five inches in the second spring grazing cycle. So we came through each of these twice, about 30 days apart. Then we switched because we lost access to the cattle. They had to go off somewhere else. We, we substituted the pay clips at about monthly intervals thereafter. And then we, we measured the fall regrowth uh, mid to late October. Total all of that up for the season for each of those treatments. Um, and to summarize, I'm only going to show you one year because it paints the picture for both years. So if we looked at adding up, now this is a harvested amount of forage growing above stubble, so it's the regrowth above the stubble. We're not sampling the full surface level. If we add up pounds of dry matter per acre from the first grazing cycle plus the second plus the first pay clip plus the second plus the fall regrowth, and you see the fall regrowth is sort of uh, virtually identical. You can total that all up. And so we're going to look at two parts of the story here. We're going to compare the previous fall low versus high forage allowance, low versus high grazing pressure. Does that have an impact on the subsequent season, total season, of growth? And you'll see it wasn't an effect the first grazing. It was not a statistically significant effect the second grazing. There was one at the first pay clip. And we actually saw more forage production from the plots that had been grazed more severely during the fall and winter. That effect, that's the only effect we saw. The 
only difference between these two treatments, but it was enough to carry over so that the total season production, not a big difference, but it's statistically significant, total season production was actually higher in more so in 2010 and 11, actually, but it was actually higher for the flocks that had been grazed more severely the previous fall and winter, which is kind of counterintuitive. And we're not entirely clear on, on why that has been. We only saw it in only two years. Now, this is maybe a more important story. Um, we also compared total forage production if you delay initiation of spring grazing until April 9th, which is the first time the pastures were grazed, or delay it until April 19th, or delay it until April 29th. Pick one of those. Well, not too surprisingly, you go from 1,500 to 1,900 to 3,200 pounds of forage per matter per acre, the longer you're willing to wait for that forage to accumulate. And so we have statistical differences at least between these numbers. Same thing happened in the second grazing cycle. You switch now to the first April, and the pattern reverses. And if you think about it, it makes sense because we cut these all on the same dates. And this one, they grew the longest. This one, they grew the shortest. So it kind of makes sense. If you total that all up, look at season total, we had more <coughs> total forage, new logical as grazed pasture and harvested hay if we defer grazing until the end of April rather than beginning grazing early April. Does that make sense? Stronger pattern in 2010 than in 2011, but similar in 2011. So severity of fall grazing impacted utilization in the subsequent growing season only in first hay harvest when there was more production to possibly raise more heavily during the fall. Doesn't quite make sense. I'm not sure why that might have been. This effect extended the total season herbage production more strongly in one year than another. But the more important point here is date of initiation of spring grazing may impact subsequent total season forage production more strongly than previous fall grazing severity. Early spring grazing appears to depend on full season forage utilization. So now we're left with, well, what do we do? Do we try to save money by grazing that forage early in the year so we can lessen supplement feeding, hay feeding, and maybe we're willing to take a penalty uh, on total season production, or do we try to protect that pasture, maximize total season forage utilization, and figure out some other way to carry the animals through the month of April, or perhaps if they're a stalker operation, you don't have uh, animals in the month of April. Uh, and so, just to summarize here and finish up, that kind of leads us to some options we can think about that we're trying to manage for, and Kathy Silver just led us through uh, some very nice uh, ideas that, that, that relate to these slides. So, depending on the animal class, the production target, the position in the season in terms of pasture growth rates, we could very easily see any of these three patterns. So the, the upper left, we've got high quality, but relatively low quantity. Bite size might be a little bit constrained. Um, part of the, the, the capture of the forage. Medium to high quality and quantity. So a little more mature protein and energy are a little lower, but the quantity is not an issue. And if you remember what Jim talked about this morning, total daily intake and animal performance are driven more strongly by quantity than by quality. So this might be sort of an optimum condition to think about if we kind of push for high individual animal performance. And then of course, if pastures get away from us in the spring, spring surplus, they're not stocked appropriately, um, we can have high quantity at the uh, expense of quality so we have these trade-offs. I'm just going to end there. That'll be some time for questions. I hope that gives you some sense. We, we, we have a lot of ideas about directions to take this work. Um, one of the uh, 
limitations to our new density work is that we're just snapshots in time. What's happening on each of those sampling days, what we really like to know is how quickly or slowly are the roots recovering from defoliation and building, and are they sort of accumulating more and more organic matter over time in some of these treatments than others? It's expensive, complicated work. But we're thinking about a cost effective way to get some of that information so that we could, we could make recommendations about certain management practices that might lead to higher soil organic matter levels over time. And all the benefits that come from better water infiltration and nutrient supplements and so on. So, questions on any of this? Go ahead. Yes, so the, so the question was, when we did those three different dates of spring grazing initiation, April 9th plus 10 days, plus 10 days, um, did we have similar amounts of forage out, out there? We only did that work for two years. Um, uh, actually, we had surprisingly similar amounts of forage on April 8th and 9th, so we just repeated. We would have shifted our dates if, if the grass had been growing earlier one year or later one year, we would have shifted. But, so what we were trying to do was was initiate the, the first day of grazing when the forage was about uh, six to ten centimeters tall, so it's two and a half to four inches tall. That's when we actually it was more like two and a half to three inches tall. That's what we set as the date that we would uh, first graze, and then whatever grew in the next ten days in the next ten days. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. I don't know if you meant did you do anything with fertility? No, we didn't. No, we didn't. Yeah. So, so there was no fertility applied to any of these. Correct. Yeah. Uh, now there had been lime applied uh, two years prior, and we did enough soil testing to be comfortable that we had reasonably uh, good conditions for fall stockpiling. This whole thing grew out of a stock fall stockpiling project, so we wanted to make sure that we had potential for for good stock fall stockpile yields. So we, and we put on nitrogen each fall. We put on 70 pounds of nitrogen as urea um, each fall for the stockpiling period. Um, uh, phosphorus, potassium, and nitrogen. Yes? When we stockpile in the fall, yes. does it matter how much we defoliate during the winter? Yeah, well, that's one of our questions. And you know, it keeps coming up and up and up is you know, we talk a lot about uh, at least in teaching, we talk a lot about the need of the residual forage going into winter uh, as uh, energy reserves to get those plants to uh, that, that dormant period. And what happens if we, if we chew down uh, the, the, the basal tissues where those reserves are stored? What happens? Um, can we expect the plants to, to overwinter as well or to recover as well in the spring? And we haven't really done very much of that work, but the question keeps coming up, and we'd like to know in, in future work, if we can get grant funding to keep doing this, what's the impact of grazing the, the uh, stubble down closer and closer and closer? What's the impact of that on the roots? Uh, and then next summer for us, we'll do some of that. What about after it's dormant? Well, yes, that's a good question. What about after it's dormant? The plants are still alive, and even though their uh, their requirements are very low, they're still alive. But we still have energy requirements to get through a long, cold, dark winter, um, and uh, and and they still have the need to, to for, for reserves to regrow in the spring before they have enough leaf area to capture sunlight. So we've still got to maintain a certain amount of energy reserves through the winter. So those plants can recover and grow in the spring. Um, so, so we really can't take them down to soil surface level. And I think that's the reason we saw a shift in our work over three years. We saw the shift, dramatic shift from balance of grasses and legumes to preponderance of legumes. I think that the white and red clovers can tolerate.
tolerate that, particularly white voters, who tolerate that rear severe grazing much more um, uh, readily than the grasses. Well, that's what I was going to say. You had a slide that demonstrated exactly what happens if you overgraze your stockpile. And that's where you lose your grass content and you increase your clover content. Dramatically. And you can also find it if you stick the shovel in the ground, you can find it in the roots. So it, it, that is exactly what happens and that was what was in your one slide. Couple housekeeping items. Yes. Trouble from the post. Uh, remember, we have non stain serve uh, beginning now. Also, if you will fill out your evaluation form, the man is on the way out. Let's get it off the street. Uh, yeah. I'd be happy to stay around and answer more if there are any other questions. But in those, right, those are the ones 